Okay, good uh, afternoon, I think. Um, I haven't actually been in a physical church for a long time, so I'm very pleased to be here for, I suppose, the start of the whole live stream, and um, may the Lord bless uh, his work at, at Good Gifts City Church. But anyway, today you're probably be wondering what on earth I'm talking about. Okay, uh, I talk fast, I talk in a substantive fashion, but the basic idea is this. Uh, today is the 10th of December 9, 2022, and about 74 years ago, the international community adopted what is known as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And human rights has become the global moral language. And the question we have to ask as Christians is, does that global new global morality, how does it square with Christian morality? Because is it something that we can agree with, or something we have to contend against, or maybe both? Today is, as I said, uh, the, the 10th of December, and in about a week's time from the, around the 19th to the 24th of December will be uh, the festival of Hanukkah, the Jewish festival of Hanukkah. But as Christians too, that has a great significance because that is a time of light. This is a time where I suppose uh, there was opposition towards uh, the faith of the Bible. Uh, there was suppression of it and a, a war was raged by the Maccabees against this. And what I want to present to you is two competing pictures. One is the idea of a distinct identity of a people set apart for God. One is the idea of a diluted people who have somehow, through assimilation and compromise, walked away from God. So kind of like uh, we're situated between uh, the idea of uh, the, uni the universal declaration of human rights as worldly values and Hanukkah as a time where people actually uh, fought against the subversion of their faith. So in a sense, it's, a, it's, it's a really a trade-off between maintaining a distinct identity as a people of God and becoming diluted. Now, this is like extremely important because what's going to happen if you actually lose this distinct identity? What's going to happen to you personally as a Christian? What's going to happen to the society you live in? If you are called to be salt and light, what exactly does that mean beyond just Christian nice words? Right? So this is what I hope to get, uh, get to today. So uh, this woman is Eleanor Roosevelt. In 1948, she was the uh, wife of President Roosevelt, the American president, and she had a very instrumental role in uh, drafting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was done at a huge international conference in 1948, just before the start of the, world War, of the Cold War. It was a pretty miraculous document because it got almost universal agreement because when the Cold War started in 1949, you know, the Soviet Union and the USA was locked in a battle that would last until 1989. There could have been no universal consensus during the Cold War. Those of you who are as old as me and are older than me, you will remember all the time it was the America versus the Soviet Union. Until the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, when suddenly the world started having a common tongue, human rights, common trade, the World Trade Organization. And I want to put this in the context of biblical prophecy and show you why this is very, very necessary uh, before the Antichrist comes and Christ comes. But here's the thing. The pattern historically is that before Christ comes, the Antichrist comes. So before Jesus Christ came the first time around, Antiochus Epiphanes, who was a Greek emperor, came first. He was a picture of the Antichrist. And because prophecy is pattern, what that means is before the second Do you all believe in the second coming of Christ? All right. I'm going to talk to you about what was going to happen before then so that we know how to resist. Okay? Because the Maccabees resisted, so we must. Anyway, as you can see, uh, as far as the Universal Declaration is concerned, it stated that human beings have great value. It stated this as a matter of faith. It didn't actually say why, right? So here's the problem. If something, if you have a great idea, but it's empty in the center, it's like a donut, right? It's like an empty container, and you can pour anything you want into that. So when it comes into this idea of faith, I mean, uh, someone called human rights, and I teach human rights law for a living, right? They call it a, you know, a, secular world, secular religion, a global secular religion. But how does it kind of add up to the Christian faith? Because I would suggest to you that there's some human rights which I would support very strongly, like the right to religious freedom. But human rights has become the global morality, which means it's become an area of intense conflict where people are trying to piggyback on the legitimacy of a human right to introduce new political claims which are more dubious. Claims like same-sex marriage, same claims like euthanasia, claims like abortion. You won't actually find this in the document itself, but people have misinterpreted it to include their own preferred political ideology. 
And this is going to be very important because the Antichrist is going to have an ideology. And I want to expose a little bit of what that's like. So if it says that you know, all human beings are, you know, have intrinsic worth, it doesn't tell us why. And we must remember that there are many ideologies which don't believe in the intrinsic worth of human beings. Aristotle, for example, said some people are born to be slaves. Confucius was pretty much not in favor of female equality. All right, and we can go on, there's the caste system as well. So when you, when you make a proposition that all people are, create, are, are equal, that's a pretty radical uh, proposition. And it's one supported by the Christian faith, because God created us Imago Dei. Now, before you had the Ten Commandments, you actually had the creation order. You may not be lawyers, but God is a lawyer and a judge. All right, so you better learn this stuff. This is not optional. This is compulsory. All right, so I have no advantage here. But the point is that the creation order says that male and female, he created them. He created them in the image of God. Right, and you have the Ten Commandments as well. Now, the interesting thing I noted is that it has, today is about 74 years since uh, the UDHR was adopted. And for those of you who are more mysterious and into Bible, the geometry and all that, uh, I'm not so much into that. I understand a little bit of it. Uh, it talks in terms about 74 meaning the absence of light, chaos, suffering, right? Some people even associate the number 74 with, with the beast. So I like to use that to, to, uh, to kind of like embody what I might call the beast system the antichrist system, okay? So I don't think all of the UDHR is bad, but the way human rights law has developed uh, has been uh, a bit trouble or concern. So um, in terms of, of, the, of the human rights, if human rights law represents a form of law made by human beings, how does it measure the law of God? Are you all under the law of God? Yes, you are. Christ not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. It's ridiculous to say that there's no law. Law comes from his character. He's holy and righteous, and the law is an expression of his holiness and his righteousness. So what we see is a conflict between the sons of Greece and the sons of, of Zion. Hopefully you are members of the sons of Zion. There must be a Greek mindset, and I may talk a little bit about that. But there's also a conflict between the prince of peace and the prince of the power of the air, who works among the sons of disobedience. So there's no neutral ground. You are in either one of these camps, right? So let's go on. So if you're creating an image of God, then you are basically accepting the fact that there is a creator who is able to say objectively who you are. But nowadays, we come to the kind of philosophy which doesn't believe in objective truth. There's no longer such a thing as truth of a capital T. There's only small truth, many truths. So what we now have is, is like if you're a man and you identify as a woman, well, then you can swim against women. Right? This is not even abstract speculation. This is American practice, and it's wicked. And it's wicked. Why? Because it goes against uh, the conception of, of who we are, who God created us to be, male and female he created us. Now Facebook will tell you there are 74 different genders. Right? And if you have children, they are going to grow up in this age, and they're going to be subverted if you don't do something about it. I know this is, I work, around, or my, my primary ministry is between people who are 19 and 25. So I'm very familiar with that mindset and the kind of, of, of pressure the Christian comes under. If you do not train your kids to be amazing people, to really understand, be able to wield the sword of God, they will be overcome. And if you're a parent, remember, why does God desire marriage? To have godly children. If you don't produce godly children, then you kind of like have missed the mark. Okay, I see one child there. So you see, the whole world is resting upon you. You cannot mess up. Right? So your parents better like give you all the support and, and love that they can. Two, two children, two children. Okay? But you know, I think about children like Dan Daniel was only 17 when he was exiled to Babylon. He was pretty amazing. Okay, so the world no longer believes in objective truth. So it goes to subjective truth. The, law, the world no longer believes in male and female because now you have transgenderism and that kind of thing. The, the world now rejects the idea that marriage is between a man and a woman. Right? Because now it's, you know, two men or two women or four or five or six, or why not have incest? And because I'm a lawyer, I know these things are actually litigated abroad. There are actually cases in Germany and America where they're trying to argue that why shouldn't two people, two adults have incest? You know, who are they harming? If you're a Christian, you need to know how to respond to this other than saying because the Bible says so, because this is not a Bible, a, a Christian law. Not yet anyway, okay? It won't be until Jesus Christ comes back. There's no peace without the Prince of Peace. So everything is provisional. So no longer is that uh, marriage as a one flesh union. Marriage is just, you know, love is love. And you need to understand that this attempt to redefine marriage is satanic in its origins. 
right? They talk about marriage equality. Do not be deceived. Every time you see, you know, one of the equality, they are lying to you. Because a homosexual man has a right to marry a woman. Don't forget that marriage has always been limited by four things. One, you must be of age. Two, you cannot be related. Three, you cannot already be married because it would be bigamy. And four, it's between a man and a woman. So they don't mind, you know, A, B, and C, but they want to change D. They do, it is not about an equal right to marriage. It is about defining or redefining marriage. And that's how it should be framed. But you need to understand that Satan is a liar and he's deceptive. And you need to have, you're going to need to have the fight on this level because you know jolly well this has come to Singapore. And if you don't educate yourself, then okay, lah. Okay, and of course, incidentally, the death penalty is also something that comes from the Bible in Genesis 9, but I won't say too much about it. Okay, so what's this beast culture like, right? Um, basically, it's the idea that there's an attempt to approximate human rights to advance a certain political agenda. So what does that mean? Basically, if human rights is an empty container because you haven't told us why people have human rights, then you fill it in with whatever you want. The danger, of course, is they could fill it in with hollow and deceptive philosophy which means any kind of philosophy which is quite separate from God, right? So basically, you can see the outplaying of Isaiah 5.20, right? Woe to him who calls darkness light and light darkness, who calls right wrong and wrong right. And I need to tell you what this is coming to. There's going to come a point in history, unfortunately, then when Christian values are going to be considered wrong, you are going to be known as a human rights violator and an outlaw. How do I know this? Because this is exactly what happened to the Christians in the first century, right? In the first century AD, when Christians were thrown into the lions, then it wasn't because, not, not, not or, or the Circus Maximus, um, it was because, not because they were seen to be, uh, well, it was because they refused to bow down to Caesar. So they were accused of, both, of blasphemy as well as sedition in that sense. And nowadays, you know, there is a kind of new religion. As I said, if human rights is a secular religion, human rights could be one of the components of the beast culture. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so what we see too is that uh, the newest manifestation, this is not a, 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 a new thing, it's an old thing, but it's the newest inc uh, incarnation, is what we call a uh, woke culture, woke mark on the cancer culture. How many have heard of the woke thing? People who are woke are actually oh, not awake, they're actually deceived, right? And the interesting thing about them is they say, well, we're for freedom, we're for equality, but they're actually for the exact opposite, right? I shall prove it to you. Right, you will see the woke culture, basically they're not interested in free debate, they're not interested in ideas, they're interested in suppressing ideas and forcing you to conform to them. Now, one thing that's clear is the way Satan works, Satan doesn't work by persuasion, he works by fear and intimidation. So when you see the spirit behind a social movement, hopefully you can identify the, uh, the, you know, the spiritual source of that social movement. So one of the things that I have to deal with nowadays is, you know, the new, I suppose, gospel is diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion. You will notice that D-E-I is a Latin word day for God. It's the new God. So when they talk about diversity, yeah, we must, we must value diversity, but the only diversity they do not value is viewpoint diversity, right? When you talk about equity, what they're really saying is not that we're all equally um, valuable in the, in the sight of God, but everything that we do, all our choices are equal. So basically, whether you read pornography or whether you read Plato, it's the same. Whether you sleep around or whether you're faithful, it's the same. Right? Equity and equality are two different ideas. And as far as inclusion is concerned, the idea here is not so much about let's include everyone. Let's include everyone so long as they agree with us. So usually the people they exclude are social conservatives and largely that, that's Christians. So Singapore is at the point where a lot of DEI ideas are coming up, particularly in the banks right, and other institutions. And we need to argue for, for fairness and equality and, and all kinds of diversity, including diversity of viewpoints, right? Because we're not here to impose our views. But if you believe the Bible is the word of God and you believe that God has a blueprint for life and living, then you need to learn to translate it in a way that other people can understand. And you also need to preserve and fight for your freedom to do, so, to do this, okay? All right, uh, okay. So what we will see then too is a, a kind of like a clash between a, a serpent speak, right? Where basically you notice that the serpent didn't bite Eve. The serpent spoke to Eve. So much of the attack is going to be through speech, not through to necessarily biting. So what we see happening now is an attempt to control speech. Nowadays, people are, 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 who are against freedom are against free speech. They'll call your speech hate speech, right? Or if you, for example, you don't approve of homosexual lifestyle, then you are full of hate. 
There's a difference between hate speech, which is directed towards saying, hey, let's kill that guy. Hate speech is about invoking violence, right? I don't support hate speech. There's a difference between hate speech and speech I hate. Just because you may not like speech doesn't mean you get to censor it, right? We need to distinguish between uh, uh, inciting violence and basically criticizing something. And of course, Christians are open to criticism as well, in a democracy at least. Okay, so uh, just be aware that even the idea of hate speech is something that is being used um, to weaponize uh, law to silence people. Now, again, why is that beast culture? Because one of the functions of, we can, we can see something is, is from, from uh, spiritually, it's from God when it brings about liberty. God says that if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Christians are always on the side of liberty. But the, Satan doesn't work for liberty. He puts us in chains. That's why Jesus came to set the captives free. And I'm a really strong believer in deliverance, and, and I think it's going to be even more important in the days to come. Why I just spent two nights ago in deliverance until about one o'clock. That's why I'm looking a bit sleepy and tired. All right? Because, you know, law students are full of demons. Okay? <laughs> it's true. Right? So basically, now and then, you know, you can see through the, through, through the hate speech, it's a culture of offendedness. People are so afraid of speaking now because you might offend someone. Right? You can't call people fat or thin or ugly or whatever or stupid. I've been told as a prophet, I cannot use the word stupid, so I don't know what substitute. But the Bible actually says that he who rejects correction is stupid. So God say what? If God say, I also can say. All right, so stupid is okay. Because you see that there is a cure to stupidity. And that's studying and wisdom. Wisdom, come, wisdom doesn't come bing upon you. Wisdom comes through heart study and experiences of life. Right? And plus, you know, if, if God doesn't give you that many brains, I mean, people say, I'm not so smart, not as smart as you, you're so smart. Yeah, it's true, I'm very smart. But do you realize that I did really badly in my in PSME? I got like really bad grades for Chinese and maths. I'm good at everything except Chinese and maths and chemistry and physics and all those kinds of things. You have to put me in the humanities and then I might, might, I might excel. My point is this. Even if you feel you have a, little, a, a very little, this is a principle in the Bible. It says that if you're faithful in the little you have, and you use it, he multiplies. You may only have two brains, but if you are uh, two, two, yeah, two, two brains, but if you uh, uh, exercise it, he will increase it. The Bible also says if you have a lot of gifts and you do not cultivate it, he'll take it away from you. So God is ultimately just. Okay, so don't ever be jealous of what somebody else has. Right? If God gives you something, it's not meant for your big fat ego, it's meant for you to use it to extend his kingdom. Okay, so personal pronouns. Right nowadays, you can't. You, people go around, hello, I'm he, her, he, she, blah, blah. they, them, rubbish. Uh, I've decided my personal pronouns are Her Majesty and Majesty, and that is how you may address me. And how dare you disagree with me? Right? It's so stupid. It's all about feelings and subjectivity. So, you know, sometimes I conquer things, but I, I, I address things straight on. Sometimes I make a joke out of it. But I'm not serious about the my pronoun is Her Majesty. Okay, so that's how you call me, Doctor Theo or Her Majesty. No, <laughs> I'm making a joke just in case you didn't realize. Okay, so uh, we know this is happening. The beast culture is coming. So basically, the beast culture comes from a, uh, uh, from from a uh, idea of what we call humanism. Humanism is that the uh, the life should be according to what I want and what I can bring about by by desire and my will. Right? This is where a lot of modern law comes from, but you can actually see where the origin of this comes from. Who, you know, God, Jesus, you know, laid himself down, humbled himself before us. What does Satan do in Isaiah 14? That the seven I wills, I will break free of God. I will rise above God. I will set my throne above God. I will be as God. My point is I'm trying to show you every TV show you watch, everything you read in the newspapers, you should be able to figure out what the, the spirit is behind what someone is saying, what someone is trying to show you. That's what, we, that's what the gift of discernment uh, is, is partially about. We see also in the last days, not only the fact that people are very self-willed, and with self they become very selfish, uh, the society begins to worship the youth, which is a stupid thing to do. I know this because I used to be a youth. I'm not anymore, and I don't want to be. But when I was a youth, I thought I knew everything. Because when you're 19 years old, of course you know everything, and you haven't seen it, it doesn't exist. That's called arrogance. The stupidity of arrogance, right? Um, and uh, how do I? And this is actually prophesied by the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah three. It basically talks about how you are going to make your youths your kings. Have you noticed that the government is consulting the youths a lot? The youths don't pay taxes. Go do NS first, lah. You know. But the point is, it says in the last days you will actually forsake your elders. You forsake those who are wise. You will treat them with contempt, and you will let your youths rule over you. 
that's a sign of a society in decline, and that's a curse, right? So you will end up having things like this, wanting to think about giving Nobel Peace Prizes to people who don't really know anything about climate change. Let me tell you, the Bible says the climate is going to change. It's going to get very hot, and there's nothing you can do to stop it. Now, it doesn't mean we shouldn't be good stewards of the environment, but to make climate a god or goddess, that's old. That's Mother Earth. That's Gaia. You need to understand that there's nothing new today. It's all the old stuff is all coming back. And here's the thing: the, the thing that stopped the old stuff, like child sacrifice in its track, was Judaism and Christianity. But as society is pushing out Judaism and Christianity, the values behind it, who do you think they're inviting back in? Why do you think everything is being sexualized today? Right? It's not just the fact that Hollywood is trying to make money. It's to do with the reintroduction of pagan goddesses. Right? Uh, Jonathan Kahn has a great book called The Return of the Gods, and he actually details Molech, Baal, and, and Ishtar, and he shows them the influence they had on ancient society. And if you compare ancient Babylonian society with present-day society, it's strikingly similar. Right? And, and you know, hopefully we'll discuss that and see what it looks like. So nowadays, people no longer care about being good. They care about virtue signaling. But virtue signaling, trying to show others that you're good, it's not virtue. It doesn't take any effort. All it takes is a click, like, click, dislike, stupid. You're not doing the heavy work of actually thinking through your position. Right? And this is it's almost as though I love the internet. I mean, but it, it also helps you dumb, dumb you down. Because now all my students are as smart as their smartphones. If I mention something they don't know, they are already finding, you know, they're looking at it in, in, in their classrooms trying to figure it out. Um, but uh, they're, they're not actually thinking through it themselves. Okay, and because one, one aspect of the beast culture, because it's very me-centered, is that you are now making laws and policies not on the basis of common sense, because it's no longer common, but on feelings. Can you imagine if you let your child run your household? Parents will understand exactly what I'm talking about. It will be impossible. It will be chaotic. This is important to know. I mean, this is why so many societies are chaotic. Again, what's, what, what's the key point I'm trying to get through? God is a God of order. He's a god of shalom. Shalom is peace and wellness and health and well-being. Satan is a purveyor of chaos. When you look at the society and you see in chaos, you can kind of figure out what is the spirit behind this. Because we all know something, right? We all know that we can see certain things, governments and all that, but we know that the invisible controls the visible. I'm just trying to give a bit more uh, concrete teeth to it. Okay, so these are just uh, certain things. No longer are people concerned with truth. They're concerned with, I suppose, their own truths. Right, but we'll move on. So there's a link in, in between, I suppose, modern day law and human rights and Laodicea. How many of you know what Laodicea? Some of you might have gone to Laodicea. What's Laodicea mean? <laughs> but you all know Laodicea, one of the seven churches in Revelation, and you know it's the one famous for being Duke Wong, which is bad because you know God spits things out. But the, the, to actually go into the idea of Laodicea, when I when I tried to link, I remember I said human rights is the global moral language but it's hollow at its core. So someone's going to fill in the gap with some kind of value system. And the dominant value system is Laodicean. What do I mean by that? Lao doesn't mean the country in, in ASEAN. Lao actually means people in Greek. And Dici or Daiki means justice. So what Laodicea means is justice of the people, not justice of God. Which means your laws no longer have any reference to the values of God. That's why you have things like same-sex marriage or transgenderism or things like that. But these things all tend to provoke confusion uh, and chaos rather than uh, shalom. Uh, so you have the return of the God. So Baal basically makes you throw out the word. Ishtar sexualizes everything, right? Uh, and, you, and you can see this all. How many of you saw the recent ad with Balenciaga or whatever, right? When there was basically they had this high-end fashion outfit, basically had a photo shoot and they had young children, younger than them, uh, basically carrying bears with uh, sadomasochistic tendencies, right? And they were seen to be promoting pedophilia because, you know, they, they kind of staged it. They even put in the photo shoot uh, uh, pages of a U.S. Supreme Court judgment against child trafficking, right? And then the people in charge are saying, oh, no, we didn't know they were doing that. You can't be that gone, right? It was such a staged thing. But the point is they're trying to peddle pedophilia. There was a backlash. Now the point is the barriers are breaking down. People are beginning to dare to promote this, right? Because Satan is after your children. Because once you get them when they're young and stupid, they won't grow up to be old and wise. That's why parents have to play a proactive role in bringing up the kids. You cannot leave it to your school and you can't leave it to your church. The church can help. 
but you cannot leave it to them. The responsibility is upon you. You see, I'm a lawyer, so I spend a lot of time wondering how God is going to judge. You know that there are two judgments, right? The first judgment, I don't think any of us will go through. This is Revelation 20 judgment. It's whether or not your name is in the book of life. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Is he your Lord and Savior? Yes. Do you know what the second judgment is? The second judgment is in Revelation 11. It is when he judges the quality of your life. You see, salvation is free, right? Open access to all. But once after you're saved, you're given a mission and a call, and God will judge you according to the extent to which you fulfill it. Do you know what success is in life? There's a very simple definition, right? The success really is this. Finding out what your mission and destiny is and completing it before you die. How many of you know that you have a mission? No, we all don't. Good. One guy, one guy, Derek. Only one guy in church. Wow, chum. All right. Well, uh, I don't think we know it all at once. I do believe that God does it pro progressively. The, 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 uh, the gift of prophecy is very helpful in this uh, accord. The Apostle Paul says you should all covet to prophesy. Do you all? Are you a prophesying church? Not a prophet lying church, right? Okay. Yeah, you know, I have all these degrees from one of the best universities in the world, but this kind of stuff I still believe. And you must never let your intellect get in the way of things which are of the spirit. Never. Right? Because God is far smarter than anybody else. Um, and more like, of course, is infanticide, and you know, abortion rates are up. So, um, what we see uh, increasingly is a mockery of the Ten Commandments. Right? We just look at the first three. Right? So, if you look at the first three, right, honor your father and mother, that's not really happening anymore. Right? People don't honor their parents anymore, and they don't honor authority anymore. And it says, you know, do not uh, commit murder. Right? Murder is just hatred. And do not commit adultery. And as far as this is concerned, adultery. Uh, actually is, when, when you read the Ten Commandments, you have to read it in two ways. You've got to see when, this is, this is just legislation, but God is saying, what, what Jesus said is, when you look at a woman of lust, that's already adultery. There's an inside aspect, because sin starts in the heart, and an outside aspect, which is when you actually express it. The word adultery also encompasses all forms of sexual immorality, including fornication, homosexuality, lesbianism, pedophilia, and all that things. Because you have to read the Ten Commandments against the light of the creation order where God has an idea of sexual morality in Genesis 2, one man, one woman, one lifetime, because sex is supposed to be sacred, right? And it's supposed to occur within the equally sacred vessel of marriage. So anything outside of marriage, as defined by God since he created it, is actually uh, what we consider to be, uh, I suppose you would call it sexual immorality. It's often not translated correctly. Actually, in Greek, it's at poneo, which includes all these forms of sexual immoralities. Okay, so it's not just adultery. It's everything that transgresses God's law. So you need to have a holistic vision of what God's law is. Okay, so uh, basically, uh, the, the warning that he's been saying to me really is this, right? Because nowadays, a lot of young Christians, the old Christians are okay, you know, because they still have common sense. The young Christians are worried about, you know, if I don't support LGBT rights, then my friends will not like me, or they might hate me, right? Um, and the only warning I would give to the younger generation, which I give continuously to my students, is this, which is, if you are ashamed of Jesus and his words, he will be ashamed of you. Right? If you won't confess your, his name before men, if you're not afraid of men and you love Jesus and you want to make him known, he will confess your name before God. There are no ifs and buts. If you are ashamed of God, and when you are afraid of, ashamed of his words, it means you are ashamed of his law. This is very important. If you are ashamed of God's law, God will be ashamed of you. This is only going to make sense if you actually believe you have to stand before God one day and, and give an account for your life. So uh, following on from this, right, if we're talking about the idea of a, a kind of ideology or spirit which, which, uh, which is uh, against God, you can really trace it back to its roots, and its roots are in the Tower of Babel. Okay, so what do I mean by this? Well, who actually built Babel? Where was Babel found? Babel was found on the plain of Shinna. The plain of Shinna is where Daniel was taken. So it's Babylon. And it's, it's so profoundly important that in Revelation, they talk about Mystery Babylon. There's a direct link between Babel, Babylon, and Mystery Babylon. But it is a site of rebellion. Okay, so Nimrod, the mighty hunter, was a hunter against God. It means actually a hunter opposed to God, someone who, who rejected God's laws. Um, then Rob came after the flood, and if you look at historical writings of Josephus, it says he was so angry that God dared to drown the earth, he wanted to create a tower so high and, and so waterproof that they could never be judged again. So Josephus actually records that they built not only with stones, but with tar, tar to make it waterproof. So this is the efforts of man, 
right? Basically saying, we want to build a civilization without you, God. We reject you, God. We don't want you, God, and we are going to God-proof our civilization. That's essentially the philosophy of humanism, right? That man is the measure of all things, and you don't need God. Now, as, as far as it's concerned, it was also a place where there was united rebellion because they were all of one language. Now, before, before the end of the Cold War, the world, was, the world was divided ideologically into capitalism and communism. Now that's more or less gone. You have human rights. It's a unifying language. Nobody wants to be seen as a human rights violator. But people now have a common moral language to use. So in a sense, it's a return to, to those kind of Babel systems where if people could not understand each other, they could not unite together in heart. But nowadays, you know, with, with translation apps, you can easily unite together in heart. And people do use the internet to unite, sometimes for good purposes, sometimes for evil purposes. Right, so this is a place where they basically were uh, rebelling against God. Uh, and uh, this is just basically uh, the, uh, Satan. You can recognize something that's satanic uh, by Isaiah 14, because that's where Satan rebelled against God. So think about it. Satan first rebelled against God. Then he tried to get man to rebel against God. It's the same thing, same spirit. Right? So I will you know, uh, ascend a, 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 across the, the throne of the God. I will be as God. Basically, I, I don't want to be under God's law. I want to be free of God, and I want to be God. It's always a two-step movement. I don't want God. I don't want any law above me. I will be God myself. An argument from liberty, I don't want God. And equality, I am God. Do you not see how this has come across our society, right? Uh, two consenting adults can do whatever they want in private. We don't want to be under any kind of law because homosexuality is the same as heterosexuality. It's an argument from equality. I'm trying to show you how that argument comes all the way back to Isaiah 14. In fact, you can see that it entered human history in Genesis 3, right? When the serpent spoke to Eve and Adam was equally at fault. Your eyes will be open and you will become as God, knowing good and evil. You don't need good and evil. You don't need God to know good and evil. You define good and evil because you are God. So Genesis 3 can be traced back to Isaiah 14, and this is the framework through which you can understand every humanistic argument made today. This is how academics teach. Like, you know, we just find the first argument, and we, everything else is a copycat. It's always, I want to be free of regulation because I am the king, you know, master of my own soul and faith. I hope you get this, okay? I'm trying to not be so cheap. <laughs> All right. So... Uh, and also, if you have the beast culture and you basically lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, you're only concerned with what you can see, hear, touch, and feel. All right? So basically, if there are still remnants of this in you, you've got to purge it out. Because we all, when we all come into the faith, we are all highly imperfect. Well, I'm still highly imperfect. But God transforms and reforms us progressively. He gets rid of the stuff, but we need to cooperate with him. It's not going to happen if, if you rebel. Okay? And they use brick for stone. This is interesting. You know the significance? Have you ever seen bricks? Bricks all look alike. Stones are all different because stones are natural. Bricks are made by man. So the, the beast culture is going to use bricks. Uh, you can see this in political correctness. You can see this in woke culture. You must all conform and agree with what has been said. If not, we cannot whack you. Right? Because God doesn't, is not afraid of diversity. He's not afraid of robust questioning, read the book of Job. But the beast culture wants to scare you or train you into thinking the same as anybody else. And they argue that they're about freedom. They're not about freedom. They're about conformity. Imposed conformity. That's why you have D-E-I, they, the new God. Okay? And let us build a city and a tower reaching unto heaven. You know the significance of that? The city is politics, the tower is religion. It's about merging these two things, right? Jesus said, render unto Caesar, render unto God, because you shouldn't fuse these things because they will be corrupted. But we see a tendency towards the desire to fuse power because that's, you know, fused power can be exploited. All right, so this tower was a ziggurat, right? The ziggurat was a way, uh, you know, Babel was meant to be the gateway to heaven. So do we see governments that are concentrating their power? I think anyone who has lived through COVID can see that this brought about an incredible centralization of power and hardly anyone questioned it. You had to stick your arms or something, you were not allowed to leave your house, you had to be masked up, et cetera, et cetera. This is just a precursor to something else. My point really is, if there's anything you remember, is the beast culture will bring forth authoritarian rule. And you know what? It's going to be worse than the time of the Nazis. We think we are so cultured, but I tell you, it's going down worse 
Bible, the Bible actually talks about a new Holocaust in Zechariah, right? Where I think it was two thirds of the Jews will be exterminated, which is horrific. But we need to be aware that this is where we're moving towards. You see, before Jesus comes back, before Parousia, the second coming, there's apostasy. So we need to understand the nature of this because we might have to live through it and hopefully survive it. Uh, let us make a name for ourselves. Rebellion. No, no, no. We want to make a name for ourselves. We do not want to have a life that, that worships God, that serves God. We just want to serve ourselves. So when you have laws and institutions which serve self-interest, then God, then you know it's part of the whole peace culture, right? Even though it comes in nice language like human rights, democracy, and the rule of law, and those have some good in themselves. So basically, Antiochus Epiphanes, basically uh, the, the Greek tyrant who basically oppressed the Jews, um, basically uh, established a totalitarian system. And we see, we see the return of that in our time through communism, fascism, and certain kinds of liberal liberalism, which basically say, you know, you are free to do whatever you want so long as you agree with me. Right, so long as you say that homosexuality is, you know, you're born that way. Well, if I'm a Christian, I'm going to disagree with that. So the Christians are always going to be on the side of moral dissent. Christians are always going to be on the side of protecting truth. All right. In fact, the whole Maccabean revolt was because of a desire to protect truth. Let me uh, hurry on. <clears throat> Much more I could say, but I, I won't. Okay, so as far as, as it's concerned, uh, this is just an account of, I suppose, uh, the Babel project and the biblical blueprint. So in the biblical blueprint, for example, there are different divisions of power between Caesar and Christ and our conscience. So when a law goes against your conscience, and I'm afraid we might come to the time where that's going to come about, the only answer I have for you is Acts chapter 5, verse 29. We must obey God rather than men. But that might cost you your life or your livelihood. So, you know, be prepared. <laughs> Am I making you all smile? Don't worry, we win at the end. <laughs> all right, we win at the end. But you know, we're going to have some hard times. But the hard times are designed to build us up and to make us stronger and to mature us. You do not want to die immature. You really don't, right? Because life is probation. All right, so I won't say so much. We'll just move on. All right, so we're coming to a time where basically, like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, there will be laws so oppressive that either we'll bow down to it and you know have our identity diluted or we will stand up and pay the price for it. You might have to go into the fire, but don't forget, Jesus is always in the fire. Okay? So basically, if he makes you go to trial, it's because he's going to give you a testimony. It's very pathetic when you have a Christian who has no testimony. How pitiful that your life is not, you're not walking him to the point that you don't have stories to tell about how he's walking with you through good times and through bad times. Right? This is a sensible church. You're not the kind of, Jesus wants to give you your best life now. I cannot stand that kind of thing. Right? You know, Jesus clearly said, you know, they hated me, they'll hate you. If you just read the Bible, you know this truth. So I don't know how, I mean, because people, it tickles the ears. I'm not here to tickle your ears. I'm here to upset you a little bit and then to cheer you up at the end. And hopefully myself as well. <laughs> All right, so Babylon is looming and God says, come out of Babylon. And here's the thing, if, he, if we were meant to live in this time, which would be difficult, there is a way out for us. And there's a way for us to be overcomers. We just have to find it. And sometimes I get scared, you know, and I ask God, how? But I come to the point I realize there is a way. I have to fight to find the way. That's part of how you know the muscles are going to be built, All right? So we have to contend. So what is the end of life? It's not just you know things like you know tribulation, hapazo, parousia, millennial kingdom, eternal judgment. The end of our life, right? The success of our life, the purpose of our life, basically, as I said, is not only to de to develop relational intimacy with Him, um, but to know our destiny and to fulfill it, uh, and basically to 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 mature in the faith, right? So I, I look at the Pauline model, and I think this is the model for the first century church, and therefore the model that the church has to follow today. And this is the way Paul did things. And I'm a big fan of Paul. I didn't used to be. But basically, he seems to have everything, right? This guy knew all about, he could evangelize at Mars Hill. He could talk to Jewish rabbis. He could teach the Bible. He was really into eschatology. The first two books, the first two letters he wrote after his three years in, in uh, Saudi Arabia or Arabia were the letters to Thessalonians. And this is all about the second coming and return of Christ. He healed the sick. He cast out demons. Uh, and he, he, also, he also raised disciples. He, was, uh, he said, you have many instructors, but only one father. Church, the church needs fathers more than it needs instructors. So in, in, his, in his life, I can see a pattern for how, what it takes to bring up a disciple. Right? Because you, you can't, you, honestly, you can't be a disciple when no one knows you in church. If you go to a 2,000-strong church, nobody knows you. I have a friend who goes to a very big mega church in Singapore. Why? Because nobody knows her. Go in, go out, escape. 
But that's not meant, that's not the community, that's not authentic community. Better to have a small church with a real community where people know each other than a crapulous, sorry, it mustn't be rude, a big church, uh, which just plays, you know, and you know, here, let's just build another big building. The time for big buildings is over. The time for intimate places like this, you know, it is on. So long as it's a place to meet, so long as it's a place to fellowship, that's all you need. Right? Don't waste, don't waste things on time on, on big buildings. All right. Okay, so we live in difficult times, so we are supposed to watch and pray, right? Uh, and uh, we need to know what, what we're supposed to watch and pray for, which is part of what I'm talking about. But I mean, here's the good news, right? Because we're watching and praying, and bad things are going to happen because the Antichrist is going to come. But the conclusion of all things, let's never forget the end. The conclusion is, is found in Acts 3, when Peter says, you know, Jesus Christ has returned to heaven and will stay there, stay there until the restoration of all things. What is the restoration of all things? Well, Part of it is uh, the earth is going to become fruitful. You're going to have trees that have fruit for 12 months a year, right? The Jews are going to go and know who Christ was, Baruch Abba, Bashem Adonai. And we're all going to be restored in our relationships. There'll be no more war, no more peace, no more crying, no more tears. But Akan Datang, that's coming later. We still have to go through uh, what we're going to have to go through. But the end of everything is just the completion of what God started at Eden. At Eden, God walked with man and woman. And at the end, God will walk. He will tabernacle with us. He already did when Jesus Christ came, and he will do it again. If you just read something like Revelation 21, 23, behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. He's all, it was always about genuine community, always about relationship. All right, so that's what we have to look forward to. Uh, so, who do, so, so if we are supposed to watch and pray, to whom does God speak? Well, this you know, and hopefully you are among the people that God speaks to. Uh, are any of you people that God speaks to? Do you all know Jesus Christ? <laughs> Has he talked to you lately? Well, here's the thing. It's not just talking to you about your personal life. That's important. But he will also tell you what's going to happen next. That's what the sons of Issachar knew. In Amos, it says he doesn't, he doesn't do anything without telling his plans to his uh, people, his prophets. Uh, Abraham was called the friend of God. And God actually said, should I conceal this from Abraham? God does not conceal things from his friends. And Jesus himself in James, uh, John 15 said, you know, I did, no longer did I call you servants. A servant does not know what the master is doing, but I call you friends because everything the father has, has done has told me, I tell you. If you're a friend of God, he will be talking to you, right? There's, there's no ifs and buts. This is what we all uh, seek to, uh, to move towards. So, you know, here's, here is a kind of way to measure your progress in him in these last days. There are at least four covenants we have to go through. The first covenant, you all know. We all start here of the blood covenant. No one becomes a Christian except through the blood of Jesus. Okay? That's when you become his servant. But there's a higher level. You can't get to level two without getting to level one. This is like primary one, primary two, primary three, primary four. Okay? So it's, uh, you got to build a bit. The second one is um, the salt covenant, and that means friendship. Right? Uh, the third covenant is the sandal covenant, which is discussed in Ruth 4, which means inheritance, which means you become a son and a daughter. You see, it's getting closer and closer and closer. Incidentally, it's not automatic. Huh? You want to be a bimbo and stay at level one, go ahead. you got to climb. You see the mountain, you got to climb the mountain. You don't have to watch some more No, you have to climb the mountain. you got to sweat a little bit, okay? Do the heavy lifting, right? So by the time you become a son and a daughter, you are an inheritor, a co-heir of Christ. But there's one covenant left, which is the closest. And can anyone guess? Let me give you is the betrothal covenant when you are the bride. How do you know whether you are the bride? I'll tell you. You all want to know? Okay, it's easy. It's in Revelation 22. It says, the spirit and the bride say, come. The people who are the bride are so in sync with the Holy Spirit, their hearts are always crying out, Bo Yeshua, Bo Maranatha. So when a Christian is not even interested in Jesus coming back, I'm going, <laughs> not bride status yet. <laughs> okay? It's okay to measure. You should measure. I mean, I'm an academic. I mark grades and grades all the time. People improve over time. And in my own life as a Christian as well, you've got to ensure that you don't miss things out. So here's the thing, right? We know when Jesus came the first time, a lot of people missed out his coming. But very few people didn't. Let's see who the very few people are. First, the old people. Hey, you old people, you're in a good position. You know why? You're patient and you've learned to wait. You may have waited a long time, but you know what? You, you are going to keep on sticking at it. That's what Simeon did, and that's what Anna did. And incidentally, Anna was 84 years old. She was in the temple praising God every day. She had an encounter with infant Jesus. And somebody pointed out she was so full of life because she was always witnessing about Jesus. You want to be old and full of life, just, you, you know, you, you, it will be evident in how you can't stop talking about him. So he, the old people didn't miss him out. 
the shepherds at Bethlehem didn't miss him out because these were the shepherds which were actually appointed. These are rough men, blue-collar workers. These are the guys who actually checked the lambs for, for the slaughter. So of course the Lord's going to go to these shepherds and go, come and see the real final lamb. Come and see him. Is he not a yearling? Is he not without blemish? Is he not the firstborn? God is very particular, right? Not the shepherds in, in, in Galilee, the shepherds in Bethlehem. And the particular shepherds that checked the lambs. So they were the ones which had the honor of checking the lamb of God. Next thing was the Magi or the Gentiles. Hey, that's us. He never forgets us. Okay? Fourth, what is interesting is, I think Derek might like this, is the religious and political mainstream was completely bypassed. Right? Completely bypassed. Because they're never looking for that. They're too vested in this world, the status quo, and not rocking the boat. How many of you are just looking for him? I mean, you have to live in this world, be in the world but not of it, but your, look, your heart is always looking for him, right? But that's interesting. I don't think you're going to find many aware people in the mainstream churches. Uh-oh, I probably got into trouble, but you know, I'm not a pastor, but... <laughs> right? Uh, and eventually, you know, and there's a mention of young people, but among his apostles and disciples are men and women and, and young and old because the whole ethos of God is he opens his arm wide to all of us. He says there's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female. We're all welcome. Okay, but it's not going to be the normal people. It's not going to be the rock stars with the 10,000 sized churches because most of the time they're preaching rubbish. Right? It's just a kind of like a self help thing. Your best life now, are you crazy? What, would, do you think that, that sermon could have helped Job? Right? What kind of l lousy, weak, diluted theology is that? Right? When your heart is broken, you need meat. Not, Jesus left you, brother. Jesus left you. No. you got to show that Job, the best man, got the worst trials. That's the starting point. And then you can start explaining why. People who have like, been broken will, will need meat. Right? So the UDHR is assimilation and the Maccabee, uh, uh, Maccabee uh, is a resistance against uh, the world and the Antichrist. What would that look like? Who are the Maccabees? The Maccabees actually, do you remember that, uh, the, that Daniel chapter 2 statue, gold, silver, um, bronze and, and iron. Uh, this all happened during the time of, of the Greeks, okay, after the book of Malachi, the so called silent years. But uh, 167 to 165, there was an old priest uh, who basically led a rebellion against uh, the Greek ruler or the Seleucid ruler called Antiochus Epiphanes, from which you get the word Antioch, okay. But anyway, why did they read a rebellion? Because this guy was anti religious freedom. He basically said, You cannot have your Torah, you cannot have circumcision and you must worship Zeus. He actually went to the temple and put uh, an idol of Zeus there. And if you did not obey, death penalty. They used to kill people and hang their bodies to terrify the people. The tactics of the devil are always related to terror. Okay? So these people, a lot of, a lot of the Jews just assimilated and, and they just, you know, bowed down just to get along and to live. But um, this old priest called, uh, called Mattathias, basically, and his sons, including Judah and Maccabee, basically led a resistance against them. Okay, and, and Judah, it's interesting that his name is Judah. Judah means praise, right? And pay, praise, praise is what leads you to conquest. So they led a three-year uh, rebellion, guerrilla warfare against the, uh, the Greeks, right? Against the Greeks who basically defiled the temple by putting a, a pig, right? And Antiochus also said, you know, his name actually means I am God. Antiochus Epiphanes, I am God revealed. He was actually a Xiao, Xiao guy, okay? But here's the thing. You have a secular leader who goes into the temple and says he's God and then slaughters a pig to defile it. Do you think this is going to happen again? 2 Thessalonians 2. When someone who, the apostasy comes and the man of lawlessness goes into the temple of God, which has not been built yet, and exalts himself and says, I am God. My point is this, you see, when you talk about prophecy, prophecy is not a one-off. Prophecy basically is is, is, it occurs in multiple times, but there's a final version. So basically the idea is prophecy is not prediction, it's a pattern. If you read the Bible deeply and you understand these patterns, you can locate it all through history. You then have the framework to understand these things. Okay, so basically there was a defilement, and rather than just living with it, they opposed it. And... Um, it's called the abomination of desolation, right? That's what Daniel called it, what Jesus himself referred to uh, in Matthew 24. So we can expect to see this again. That's why my eyes are always watching Jerusalem to see what's going on there. If you're going to watch and pray, you need to know what you watch. You cannot be blah, blah, watch for what are. You need to know exactly what you're watching for. Because very often, you know, you go to church, you must watch and pray, and you're like, okay, now step online and pray. 
but you're not actually asking the heart lords, huh? where are we in history? When are we in history? What should we be looking for? So how, I'm, I'm sharing this with you because I'm, even though this happened a long time ago, and you know, in, in the second century BC, it's going to happen again, or if it hasn't already happened again. Um, so what happened was, you know, there was a shift in, uh, in, in empires from the Persians to the Greeks. The Persians actually promoted pluralism. They said you can have whatever religion you want. That's what Cyrus the Great allowed. But when the Greeks came back, Antiochus and he said, you can't have any religion you want. You must follow my religion. Okay, so it's not the absence of religion. It's the presence of coerced religion. So basically, the Greek mindset is that of, you know, humanism, right? You don't need God. We can do all things by ourselves. Or false religion, right? What we call heresy. Because it's funny that they gave us both humanism as well as many false religions. And you can actually trace a lot of other religions to Greek religion. But I don't dare say anything because, you know, I'm in Singapore. <clears throat> All right, uh, and they also brought about not only prosecution of believers, but a perversion of, of them as well. And they corrupted the religious leaders. Right, it came to a point. You know that you become a high priest by lineage and by God's selection. They were buying it with silver. Okay, and this is this is why you need to understand history. It's very dangerous when a, when a society does not understand history. Not only its own history, but the history of the world. How can you possibly understand prophecy if you don't understand history? Right? And I know, I know from my students, at least, that they hardly studied any history of any significance when they were in secondary school. I actually studied Mesopotamia when I was in Sec 1. I studied Mesopotamia, Phoenicia, all these really, really good things. I think the church needs to, think, to teach this again as a way of situating biblical prophecy. Right? So, uh, which means you have to think, la, I'm sorry, la, God likes nerds. Right? So if you're not nerds, too bad. You're going to really, really miss out. And I speak this as a proud nerd, right? Okay? <laughs> And many people were Hellenistic, which meant the Jews had assimilated. And one, one, one area of the clash was in the fact that the Greeks introduced this thing called gymnasiums. Why? Because they exercised naked in gymnasiums. And if you're Jewish, you're very modest. Now, have any of you been to like any gym lately? You know, usually people there, you know, book up all right. They don't even wear clothes, right? Why? Because they're there to show off their biceps and their triceps and whatever else. It's all about bodily perfection and all that kind of thing. But it also become, it can become very lewd. Right? When you go out clubbing, do you wear a lot of clothes or too little clothes? Usually not much clothes, right? So what on earth are you doing? Is it a meat market of some sort? A Christian cannot act this way. I have, I have students that say, oh, prof, prof, I used to go clubbing. I go, okay, you sure have got demons. <laughs> right? Cast out. And the point is that uh, when they meet Jesus and they start developing a relationship with him, they don't want to go to a club because you don't go to a club to have meaningful conversations. I know this. I've been to clubs. I used to be in a rock band. Well, Derek fortunately met me when I already had met Jesus, so he had cleaned up a lot of rubbish. But when you go to a club, you can't even hear someone. There's no meaning there. It's just, hey, baby, you look at it. <sighs> right? It's stupid, and yet they think it's cool. But it's just dumb. It's like a meat market. But, you know, I'm, I'm just basically an old-fashioned Christian. Actually, no, I'm very new-fashioned because it's old-fashioned to be here. It really is because they've been here for a very long time. I'm a part of the new wave in that sense. Okay. Right? And, and basically, you, know, you will have dictators with strong roles, and they will be particularly against religious freedom. Right? So when, you, when I track what other countries are doing, and I see their laws on religious freedom, I see whether or not they're good countries or bad countries. I base this on Acts 17, verse, uh, when it says that you know, God sets us in nations, not empires, so that we can seek him and find him. You can't seek God without religious freedom. So when you live in a country where there's no religious freedom, it's that much harder. Right, so hopefully, I, I hope you're getting you know, some indicators of how to identify a beast culture and a beast system in, a, in hopefully a reasonably practical way. Okay, let's move on. All right, so just to show you uh, that um, one way you can see that you're in a, moving towards a beast system is uh, anti-Semitism and anti-Israel will rise. Let me just show you. that You know there's a magazine called Foskin Man? Yeah, it's horrible. Now, I want to say to you the history of human rights. Part of it was the reaction against the Holocaust. Right? Because the Jews, the Jews had their property and their religion and their lives taken away. But now human rights is being misused in a very anti-Semitic fashion. So basically, there's a bunch of people who believe in bodily integrity. Right? A baby has a right to his foreskin. So what they've done is they've begun to agitate for this. So you're not using human rights for whatever you want. So once upon a time, it was to protect Jews and other minorities. Now it's being used to whack Jews. And look at how they're drawing Jews. Do you know that this is extremely anti-Semitic? Do you know that when, when uh, Adolf Hitler was trying to stir up hatred against Jews, he drew these things? They look the same to me. 
right? The two on the, on the far right are the ancient things from the 1930s. What you see is the more modern day version. You may think, haha, it's a bit funny. But this is just, you know, a barometer of what, what is happening. It's also to keep you awake because I show cartoons people wake up, right? So the thing about of this, right? So Babel is, and, and, and the UDHR are all pictures of the beast culture and system, but we are meant to resist that, right? Hanukkah is about resisting darkness in the area of light. But the Bible actually says that it's not so much Hanukkah, but Kislev 24. That's the 24th day of the ninth month, right? Uh, which is coming soon. And this goes all the way to the book of Haggai. And in the book of Haggai, they had rebuilt, they were rebuilt, they had laid the foundations of the temple, but it wasn't completed yet. Do you remember that by Hegel was saying, you're spending all your time building your own houses, but my, whole, my own house is in ruin. Why don't you build my own house? So when the Jews began to lay the foundations, before they had even completed the mission, God says, from this day, I will bless you. Do you know when your heart just takes one step towards God, he blesses you. You don't even have to finish it because God looks at the heart. And if your heart is determined, you will finish it. But he doesn't wait for you to finish it to bless you. Here's the 24, from this day, the day I mount, when your heart turned towards me, when you start building my house, and you're building his house in this church. You can expect him to bless you. Don't expect Mercedes and whatever, but you can expect revelation and healing and spiritual blessings, which is actually more precious if you think about that. Okay, so, all right. So this, this is basically what uh, it stands for. This is what, uh, you know, Jesus himself celebrated Hanukkah. Uh, they call it the Feast of Dedication. If Jesus celebrated it, good enough for me, okay? And it's a time where the temple was cleansed from defilement and where the, you know, the menorah was lighted again. Uh, and, and so it's something worth us celebrating because ultimately um, God, is, God is light, right? And, he, and when, when, you know there's no sun in, in, in the final kingdom, right? Because he's the, he's the light. He's always about light. The very first thing you read in the Bible is, yeah, he all, let there be light. We are meant to be, you know, he's the light of the world. He says, you are the light of the world. And sometimes we feel quite loud, Bob. It doesn't matter, the light is still in you. You just have to kindle it. That's why he had to tell to kindle, burst into flames the gifts in you. Sometimes our fires go quite low. So how do you get your fire strong again? You blow on it. You open yourself to the Holy Spirit and he blows. And then you kindle it. It's okay if the, if the fire goes strong, the fire goes weak. Life is about waxing and waning. But we can always be refreshed by him. What is also interesting is because this date is so important to God. It's the date that not only that you know Jerusalem was liberated from the, from the Greeks, it was the date also that in 1917, when the British actually liberated Jerusalem from the Ottomans. There's a lot of history here, but I'll just say the British were not perfect, but they set Jerusalem, they set the whole of Israel on track to become an independent nation in 1948, right? My point really is that uh, good things tend to happen on similar dates because God is making a memorial, okay? All right, so here are all our choices between distinct identities and dilated identities, which I shall not go through because I think you might die. Right, but the basic. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a bit over ambitious. But if you look at it, all right, I'll just do one or two. Okay, so it says here, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You know, a people who has own possession, as opposed for someone who lives his life for himself. Uh, secondly, you are a friend of God. But if you are a friend of God, you become a stranger to the world. On the other hand, if you are friends of the world, you become an enemy to God. You have to choose. There's no Switzerland of neutrality here. You have to choose. You've got to choose a country. Uh, those who are his will have a sense of resistance because they know they're not at home yet and the world's getting darker and darker. But they will be faithful uh, uh, and, and loyal to God um, as opposed to those who assimilate and apost become apostate. Apostasy is important. Apostasy means to fall, to defect from truth. Apostasy only applies to Christians, right? The Christians whose love become cold. Be careful, all right? Because it, it could happen. I hope it doesn't happen to you. Um, and uh, as you know, God says be salt and light, but you can become saltless and you can lose your light. But here's the most uh, 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 thing I want to underscore. You're going to have to have courage and endurance to last. And the opposite of courage is cowardice or delos in Greek. Lose moral gumption, uh, uh, loses moral gumption needed to follow the Lord, excesses fear. Uh, it says clearly in Revelation 21.8 that the, the cowards do not inherit the kingdom of God. You are disinherited. So you can either choose to fear God or fear man. Isn't that terrible? You have so much power to choose. You are not an automaton. The decisions you make are profoundly important. That's how much dignity you have, right? If life is probation, then you must choose well. And of course, at the end, I, I hope to, to, be, to inherit as well rather than to be cut loose. 
Okay, so what is your trajectory? This is again an attempt to summarize. I know I tend to be very dense, but just to get it really clear in your head, right? That if you basically have a distinct identity, you will have the characteristics of the Maccabees. You'll be outraged at an attack on your faith. You'll be outraged at defiling the temple and you will resist it, right? Which means that when you see evil, you will groan inside. Do you know that when you groan inside over evil, God makes a mark of you? He says that in Ezekiel 9. You know, go and mark everyone who groans, groans and sighs over evil and don't harm them. But for all the rest, whack them. You see, before God judges, right, he separates people. Think about it. Why do you think he let the wheat and the tares grow together? And then said, at the end of the age, then we'll have a harvest. See, here's the thing. For the longest times, there has been mixture, right, which means a little bit of good. Human rights has good and human rights has bad. But it's the same thing in churches. The good churches, bad churches, very often it's mixed. But towards the end of the age, there is a separation. Here's the thing. God always separates. Satan always conflates. To conflate is to mix. How do I know God always separates? The first thing he did was to separate light from darkness. See from then. And he says in Malachi, that, you know, in Malachi 3, in the last day, you will once again know those who serve God and who, those who don't. And you know how... It's going to be clear because right now within any church, there's, there's wheat and tares. There's going to come a time where it's going to cost to be a Christian, when there are going to be laws that oppress you. And the issue then is, will you speak out against that? Will you assimilate to the culture of your age, you know? Or will you uphold the ideal of sexual purity and live it in your life? I'm sorry, guys, you're going to have to be real Christians. <laughs> you cannot play play, lah, right? Uh, so at the end of the age, the wheat and the tares will be clear because there will be, God will orchestrate things uh, to make us make a choice. When I was growing up as a Christian, a kind of Anglican, pseudo-Christian at least, you could just go to the big church, the big cathedral there, and nobody would notice you. Uh, and I bet you a lot of people there were not Christians. Because I've come to the conclusion, just because you say you're a Christian doesn't mean you are. There's a more substantive test. The test is actually in Corinthians. He says, see whether or not the spirit of Christ is in you. And, and you must know the traits of the spirit of the Christ, the fruits and the traits of that. Okay, so let me <clears throat> go on. Assuming you're still awake. Derek, try and keep away. Okay, it's going to stop soon. <laughs> okay, so basically God marks those who are his. We have the power of great choice, but God will always set the boundaries. So you can't rewrite the boundaries yourself. So for example, um, you can see that uh, the choices will include whether or not you want to be blessed or cursed is in Deuteronomy 28. He says, if you do this, you're blessed. If you do this, you're cursed. You better know what Deuteronomy 28 says because these are spiritual laws that govern your life. It's on you if you're ignorant. And hopefully you're in a church where you're not allowed to be ignorant. In fact, you should despise ignorance. And you should ban the word chim from your vocabulary. Just because something is hard to understand doesn't mean you give up. It means you double down. Sorry, academic speaking now. Or you can be a little academic wimp if you want. I have just no respect for people who won't even try. I don't understand everything. I have a lot of problem with the book of Ezekiel. If anybody wants to tutor me in that, I would be very grateful. I once tried to read it through. I stopped at Ezekiel 20 because I was just overwhelmed. But it doesn't mean I'm not going to get go at it again. It's like you, you try to sum it once and you fail, but you got to the middle point and you try again. And eventually, through perseverance, you will make it to the top. But you're going to have to sweat, lah. Pastor Derek cannot do it for you. He's too old already. La. He's already had to sweat so much in his life. He was my pastor at COS, and that's like, I'm very really old too. So it's like, oh gosh, we're both antediluvian, I guess, <laughs> right? But you know, we're still, we're still serving the Lord. So God sets the boundaries, right, uh, between the land and the sea. And here's the thing Have any of you noticed this? When a country becomes lawless, the boundaries begin to fall. Can anyone see the link between Psalm 80, 13 and these incidents in Singapore recently? when you don't just have people coming across wild balls, but wild balls charging at you. Psalm 80, 13 is about the boundaries have come down and the balls have infiltrated. So those of you who are Issacharites will understand what's going on and it will spur you to intercession and prayer. We need to learn to understand the times and God, will, and this is not through old oh, visions, it's through the word of God. I don't trust a prophet who doesn't know the word of God, by the way, but a prophet who knows the word of God. <laughs> That's the kind of person I would sit under. You do realize some prophets are just hot air and smoke, right? You know, the, the ones that say, Yo, the Lord is here, and the Spirit is here, and I feel the glory, and here's the gold dust. Um, I do believe that in miracles, but I don't believe in emotionalism. I really believe really, And I'm very skeptical, because if it's not in the Word of God, I'm very uncomfortable. 
maybe I don't know where in the Word of God, so then it's my job to go and seek it out myself. Right? But I never accept things blindly, and neither should you, because you have a brain. Right? I cannot stand the Christian, Pastor say so, therefore is so. Shut up. I tell you, I had a student who was visiting uh, Israel recently, and she WhatsApp me, and she was very angry, because I spoke, I've ruined all my students. Right? They're very critical people. And there was someone on this tour, a Methodist tour, she said, they wanted to buy a menorah. And the pastor said, cannot, it's Jewish. I went, uh, you do realize when you read about the seven lampstands and revelations, they're all menorahs, right? Right? And you know, it, the menorah is a symbol of Christ, of the light of the world. But you see, the person just accepted whatever the pastor said. Now, if the pastor is anointed, great. But the pastor is wrong, then you've got to call them out. Because well, Pastor Derek is exempt because he's right. <laughs> Hey, this is a guy who I heard preaching in the 1990s. And I'm here out of love and respect for him. If not, I'd be sleeping. All right? Because I, I recognize quality. And you have a really, really good person here. So you must honor him. Okay? Promise? All right. <laughs> okay, let me, let me finish up because you're probably fed up with me. So basically, um, right, you're supposed to be salt and light. But you know that salt can only preserve if it's, a, it's enough salt, right? Uh, and, and this is what you've got to pray, that you've got to pray that the remnants in Singapore will remain large enough to influence uh, law and society and culture. Right? So we're supposed to see the light of the world, public witness, that kind of thing. Um, but also that uh, you must also be uh, someone who shows light. So salt is a preservative, but light shows us uh, the way, right? how to do certain things. Okay. <clears throat> And we'll see that uh, the principles are found in Goshen. Even though Egypt was covered in darkness, Goshen still had light. You are meant to be that, those points of light, uh, wherever you are, in your workplaces, in your homes, in your jobs, that kind of thing. As I said again, remember, God separates light from darkness. Satan conflates. He loves gray. He can hide in gray. All right, he, I'm like the world. Jesus said, you are the light of the world, uh, and the world hates light. So if the world hates you, don't be surprised. And you know why the world hates light? Because light exposes sin. Right? I actually believe that deliverance is really, really important. But you know, law students are very proud. So I tell them, okay, like, you're so proud, you stay, let the demons stay. They, you know, you're so nice and comfortable. You go ahead, hang out your demons. Oh, don't, don't, don't. I, said, I said, until you are humble enough and willing to confess, I'm not going to pray for you. Don't waste my time. I've done this for 30 years. It's not as though it's new for me anymore. I'm not Douglas Cole. It doesn't excite me that much. Okay, I'll do it because it has to be done. But the point is this. I, there are two ways you can get you know, demonic influence out of your life. I'm sure most of you already know it. Just think about it this way. The devil is darkness. God is light. Bring it out. James 5.16, confess your sins to one another, pray for each other that you may be healed. So some people go, why cannot I stay at home and pray for myself? I go, yeah, I, I do believe self-deliverance is possible, but there's something really humbling about confessing your sins in front of somebody else. It breaks pride. right? With my students, because they're all so foul, and my students are not babies, huh? 19 to 25-year-olds, I now operate on what I call the presumption of pawn or pop. You see, in, in you know, 30 years ago, it's like you talk about pawn, but all very shamefaced, you know, and, and you know, but nowadays you just click on your internet, it's there. I now assume all my students are watching pawn, right? And that means they're gonna have certain spirits at him, but it's worse than I thought. Right? I just did another round of deliverance and I realized I not only had to ask the question, are you watching pawn? Because that would defile you. I now have to ask the horrible question: what kind of pawn are you watching? And I hope you're old enough to know, I, I'm not going to go into details. But I tell you, you all need to rise up and become demon slayers because the need is so profoundly great. So either you need to get clean up first, because once after you're clean up, then you are released. And frankly, to me, deliverance is an ongoing thing. I still need deliverance. Deliverance is like taking a bath, right? Because God gives greater revelation of whatever demonic influences in you and in his name, they have to flee. And then, you know, Christians, usually of the Calvinistic disposition, say to me, um, if you are a Christian, uh, then how can you have demon? Because um, it's not the Holy Spirit in you. I went, yes, the Holy Spirit is in you. <laughs> Sorry. I get very irritated. I've been answering the same kind of questions for many years. So I go, yes, the Holy Spirit is in you, but if you're watching porn, he ain't there. If 99% of your brain is pure, but 1% is in darkness, what have you opened the door to? Right? And anyway, I would say this. Yes, you belong to Jesus. The Holy Spirit is in you, but he's a deposit guaranteeing all things to come. So when you buy a house, you have title deed, right? And you go to live in your house, but you find squatters, and the squatters are bigger than you. So you have to call the tingta, the police, to come and evict them. Deliverance is eviction. You need to have... That's why I never pray deliverance for a non-Christian. 
only for Christians, right? Because Jesus has legal title to them and I'm just there to enforce legal rights. I know I made it sound kind of boring, but it's not. I need to understand this myself to understand what I'm doing. And I tell all my students, when you cast demons out, you don't need to shout. <laughs> you can be very quiet. You can just go and whisper, right? Because, you know, Christian charismatics are very, very loud. You know, when I came back from England, studying in England, I went to Cruz, right? And I knew about inner healing because of the vineyard movement in England. When I came back to Cruz, first of all, the music and which it was so loud. Secondly, it was such a deliverance-oriented church, and it was so loud. Chinese Christians particularly are so loud. Because the English, you know, the, you know how English people cast out demons? Hello, you know, you're a demon, and this is a Christian. You need to leave. Oh, must I leave? Yes, I'm afraid you have to. Okay, go. In Singapore, it's... Out, in name, out, out. I prefer the Singapore way, by the way, but there's no need. Volume is not going to get the demon out necessarily. All right? Okay, I, I think I will just close on one final point right, on deliverance. Because, because the world is getting darker, we need to be more spiritually attuned. And deliverance is going to be very important because a lot of people are just kind of like trapped in immaturity because they're not free, uh, they're, they are, they're enslaved. So how many of you remember the story of Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman? Remember, she was a Gentile. And she went to Jesus and said, my daughter is demon-possessed. Please, can you set her free? And Jesus said, no. Can you imagine Jesus saying no? Well, you know Jesus, he's a good teacher, right? And he's, when he says no to you, sometimes he wants you to come back at him. No, I'm here with the, for the household of Israel, and it's not right to, feed, to take the children's bread and feed it to the dogs, which is very insulting. I like dogs myself, so I don't see it as an insult, but you know, in that context, it was an insult. But here's the thing that you know. I mean, eventually she said, yeah, but even the dogs have the crumbs. And he, oh, your faith is very great. She's free. But here's the point. Deliverance is called the children's bread. We pray, give us our daily bread. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Bread is sustenance. It's what keeps us alive. That's the word of God. It's the healing of God. It's the deliverance of God. Deliverance is the children's bread. It's meant to be normal and part and parcel of our lives. And you know, there was no deliverance in the Old Testament. The first act of deliverance was in the New Testament, and it occurs in Mark chapter 1, right, in Capernaum. And this is interesting. When, in Mark 16, when he says, you know, go into all the world, right, the first command he gives, you go and preach the gospel, cast out demons, heal the sick, right, when you, you know, snakes and all that kind of thing. So it's not meant to be something uh, uh, which is optional or only the major Christians do it because the Bible doesn't talk about major and minor Christians, it just uses the term Christians. The interesting thing though, and I'll end on this, right? if we are supposed to be a distinct identity, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, then we'll be doing the acts of what Jesus did. Isaiah 61, preached the gospel, healed the sick, set the captives free. But in Mark 16, the thing that really excites me is, is after Jesus gave the command, they then say, oh, and his disciples went out, you know, and, and they set, free, set the captives free. And it also says, and Jesus was with them. Which means when you go out and do the works of the kingdom, I mean, I, I really held this in my heart two nights ago when I was doing deliverance and I actually prayed. So I was trying to train a bunch of young people and I said, when we pray in his name, he's with us. And because he is with us, it gets done. Right? And you know, sometimes, I mean, I'm a very Old Testament person and God sometimes has to push me back to the New Testament. And I thought, that's just such a simple verse in Mark 16 that when they pray, Jesus was with them and it was done. Right, so my, my whole point is, we have a distinct identity. We will be able to do the works of the kingdom. Right, everything that Paul did. But the, I mean, I don't like apologetics, but I can do it. Uh, religious scholars, I leave that to Derek. Uh, right, evangelism, public square, all these kind of things, healing, deliverance, everything that he's called you to. And incidentally, deliverance is not a gift. It's an assignment, which means like all Christians can prophesy, not all are prophets. All Christians can engage in deliverance. It may not be a major ministry, uh, but it, it's certainly something you should know how to do. Same thing with healing. I'm not saying I'm an expert on healing. I think I'm pretty weak on it. I think my faith level is very low for that. I need to improve. But my faith level for deliverance is very high for some reason. right? So God gives us strengths and weaknesses, and our job is to know where we're strong and to build it up, and to know where we're weak and to build that up. right? Because anything and everything is only ever done in His name. So uh, my conclusion really is this, right? that while, while it is still day, we have to... Uh, be busy, right? Because night is coming when no one can work. So my prayer for all of you is that hopefully through my long and lost all kind of thing, you got this idea that it's very important to hold on to your distinct identity, right? That you refuse to be diluted, you refuse to be assimilated to the world, and that you will, you will, when you come before the Lord, right? Because I've said we all have to climb higher, we all have to upgrade. 
start by asking him, uh, what's the next thing you want me to learn about? What's the next thing you want me to deal with? But don't allow yourself to get, you know, kind of like in the middle ground and, and, and you know, lose your sharpness. Right, so if I may, I'll just close briefly in prayer. Lord, I just thank you for those who have kept awake. Uh, I just pray that whatever what there was of you will stick in the heart and will bring forth life. I pray that you will speak with them, Lord, uh, that you will you impart to them a greater measure of their destiny and their call, and that they will come to you and, and look to you for equipping, Lord, uh, to understand the gifts of the Spirit, to cultivate the fruits of the Spirit, to love your word, to love your name, Lord. Uh, bless upon Lord and as they start this new chapter of live streaming in this place I pray that you will be here with them Lord that you will give them so much joy and so much pleasure that when they pray for each other they will sense your presence and sense your anointing and just see a little bit of what you're going to accomplish we pray your kingdom come and your will be done and we just pray and thank you Lord that we have freedom today to come together in your worship so see the in the hearts of those who call you Lord and bless them Lord in Yeshua's name I pray, amen. amen. Shall we